and welcome to this, the third live session of International Treasury Week. This session is to be sponsored by Lloyds, and we're going to be discussing the highly relevant topic of risk management in uncertain times. Everybody knows that risk management is an evolving topic, and particularly if you've been listening in the last hour, you'll realise that one of the joys and the nightmares of working in Treasury is that every day is different, and things can change incredibly quickly. And it's certainly very true at the moment. Reviewing your firm's risk appetite and how that may play out in financial risk management policies, procedures and strategies is likely to be the near of the your board's agenda, if only because they will need to explain it to stakeholders at some point in the near future. As is often the way with developments in the financial markets, many things are outside the trigger of control. Nevertheless, non-financial corporates need to understand what's happening in these markets and how they can translate in, in ways that are appropriate to their organisation. After all, it's the role of the treasurer to help the organisation understand, identify and manage risks. And the purpose of this webinar today is to really help people do just that, by providing you with an update on market conditions, but also suggestions on how firms might want to respond to what is increasingly looking like the new normal, whatever that means. Um, and in addition, we we'll hope to answer some of the questions that were actually raised in the last session, where we heard treasurers talking to each other about the sorts of challenges that they've been facing. So, uh, over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm delighted to say that Lloyd's are going to explain what's been happening on a macroeconomic basis, what this means for various markets that are of particular relevance to corporates, such as FX and interest rates, and share the latest developments and touch on some of the challenges that are facing corporates and how we might like to address them. Obviously, we'd like this session to be as interactive as possible, so please submit questions as we go through. You'll see a button on your screen that allows you to submit questions, and we'll try and track all of them as we go along, so please don't wait to the end to send them in. Um, the session is going to be recorded and the uh, proceedings will be made available on the event walkables shortly after the session finishes. Right, let's start off the housekeeping. And so before we start, let me make some introductions. For those of you who don't know, I'm Sarah Boyce, and after many years of working in corporate treasury, and I work providing policy and technical advice support here at the ACT. And today I'm delighted to welcome, and you'll be relieved to hear we have some experts joining me. Colin McKee is Head of Financial Risk Advisory at Lloyd's and heads that Financial Risk Team, Advisory Team in Corporate Sales. Sam Hill is the Economist of the Outfit. He's Head of Economic and Market Insight for Lloyd's Bank Corporate Markets. Uh, Neil, Neil Crokey is Managing Director of Large Corporate Rates. He's the Rates Bureau and runs the corporate rates team covering UK utilities and companies in the UK, Europe and the US. Last, but by no means least, is the FX guy. Rodri, Rodri Hughes is director in the large corporate FX sales team at Lloyd's. Right, that's enough for me for the time being. Let me hand over to the experts. So Colin, would you like to kick off? Thanks very much, Lisa. Yes. yes. Um, as you said, these really are unprecedented times. Um, I mean, you can point to any number of, of newspaper headlines or market announcements over the past two or three months to confirm that. But I, I think the one that probably stuck out the most for me was from last week's Financial Times, uh, where it quoted Andrew Dilley, the, the head of Bank of England here in the UK, stating that the, the UK was uh, set to enter its worst recession for 300 years, the fastest and the deepest recession since the Great Cross of 1709, allegedly. Um, quite, quite quite something. Um, over the next 45 minutes, uh, as we can turn on to the next slide, please, we will endeavour to put that into some context. Um, I think it's fair to say that over the last number of years, there's been a relatively prolonged period of sort of relatively low volatility, maybe benign or favourable financial markets for corporate treasurers. Um, this has very much come to an abrupt end, obviously, with the COVID-19 crisis. And we look at, uh, as Sarah alluded to, some of the key areas of focus with respect to corporate risk management and corporate treasury over the next 45 minutes. So going through the different asset classes, FX, commodities and interest rates, we'll try and pull that together and look at uh, what this might mean for treasury policies going forward and how some of these risks might play out over the longer term. Um, 
so I suppose without further ado, I'll maybe hand over to, to Sam and the economic side. I, I think before I do that, I'd probably say that whilst the COVID-19 crisis is, is obviously front and centre of everybody's mind at the minute, it's probably important not to forget that there's a number of other geopolitical and market risks in the horizon. So that even once we work through the current crisis, which will inevitably take some time, it may not be back to uh, the, the sort of plain sailing that, that people are familiar with over the last number of years. Uh, so Sam, with that, over to you to maybe capture some of those economic risks. Good afternoon, Colin, and uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, just uh, three slides from me, a uh, quick 10-minute wrap-up. Uh, on the macroeconomics. So first slide, please. Next one, I think. And the next one, the first chart. Yeah, there we go. That's super. So yeah, we'll talk about some of the other risks, but it seems um, uh, impossible not to start with the virus. Uh, and this chart here is a look at some estimates done by modelling from the OECD on the impact on G7 economies uh, of the shutdowns on economy. And roughly speaking here, the interpretation of this chart is to look at the loss output in these economies for the um, length of time that each economy is under lockdown restrictions. Um, so um, give or take for most of these economies, you're talking about 25% of normal activity um, not being able to take place um, for the length of time that, we're, that, that these countries are in lockdown. Uh, so, uh, you know, an unprecedented situation. Uh, and also here you can see an attempt um, to uh, model that by sector. Um, now, clearly, um, very difficult to make these estimates, but uh, I think by far and away, uh, the most important point here is um, this is a very challenging uh, position to be starting from. Uh, whether uh, you're in um, the, uh, the retail sector, uh, the professional re real estate, construction sector, or, or whatever. Um, but I think the one thing that we can say, uh, if we look at the next slide, um, is that there has been a um, huge amount of stimulus, both by the monetary policy makers and the fiscal policy makers. Uh, and what I'm trying to illustrate with this chart here um, is the monetary re policy response. Um, and um, this chart shows 10-year gilt yields going back to uh, late last year uh, and all the way through to uh, the start of May. Uh, and the point that I'm trying to illustrate here is that up until the point when the Bank of England announced its latest £200 billion pounds of QE, um, the um, uh, gilt yields were starting to rise quite materially. Uh, and this was in response to uh, the fiscal packages that governments were putting in place, very costly. Uh, and I think investors were starting to worry about um, the levels of, of borrowing that, that would be required uh, and therefore demanding a high yield to absorb that assurance. Well, since the Bank of England introduced its QE programmes, Yields have collapsed, and they've been not just low, but also very stable. And I think this is the first important message uh, from me, um, is uh, that not just for governments, but also for consumers and for businesses that depend uh, on uh, interest rates, and the fact that government bond yields are low uh, will have an impact on the interest rates that percolate through to the rest of the economy. Uh, and it seems to me increasingly that the sort of language that we're hearing from central bankers uh, suggest that this low stable interest rate environment is going to be in place uh, for a long time. So I think that's a key message uh, on the rates front. Um, if we go forward to the next slide, um, my final slide, um, you can see here um, some uh, attempt to illustrate the size of the fiscal packages that governments across G20 economies uh, have put in place. Um, and you can see that for each economy, the, um, light, the bar that's shown is as a percentage of their own GDP, what their fiscal package they put in place is. Uh, and um, for uh, Germany, Italy, that's uh, over 30%. The UK in fourth position there, at almost 19%. Um, so a huge range of total numbers and also quite a range in terms of the composition of the stimulus. So um, a lot of the stimulus in uh, those countries on the left-hand side of this chart is the government offering guarantees um, to bank loans or um, underwriting risk um, rather than necessarily funding um, programs up front, although um, the dark green bars show that those um, upfront um, uh, interventions that do uh, require government borrowing today, uh, such as the job retention scheme in the UK, uh, are, in, are in many ways very costly interventions too. Uh, and I think that may, in some cases, um, you know, drive the 
speedier response um, in terms of uh, easing lockdown um, because there will be some questions of fiscal sustainability. So uh, I think you know the message here really is that um, these fiscal packages have been uh, possible, but one of the main reasons that they have been possible is because the central bank has moved through QE um, to stabilise yields such that the numbers that you can see on this chart, big percentages of GDP, uh, have been um, credible and feasible uh, without um, sending interest rates to uh, uh, high and destabilising uh, levels. So what's the outlook from here, given that we've had that stimulus put in place? Well, I think really um, the main thrust of all of this public policy is to try and limit the degree of scarring of the economy. So it's inevitable that when uh, economies are in lockdown, that there's going to be a loss of activity. By design, that's what's supposed to happen uh, to a certain extent. But really, these fiscal packages are designed to ensure that when things do um, reopen, that uh, the level of activity can get as close as possible, as quickly as possible, to where it was before um, the virus hit. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, then the degree of scarring will be limited, um, and, and that will be a success. Um, but if that's not the case, and if there is some scarring, then unfortunately the fear is that economies won't return to the pre-crisis peak uh, quickly or immediately or fully. Uh, and I think that's really what we're doing now is all of um, the uh, attention of economists and market participants is looking uh, at the uh, degree of scarring and the risks, therefore, to whether or not there can be a V-shaped recovery or uh, whether we'll have more of a U or an L or some other uh, shape to the recovery. Now, I think probably at this stage it's still too early to say, uh, but it does feel as though a pure V-shape um, is uh, on the optimistic uh, end of things. Um, and um, therefore, um, you know, some of the other uh, factors to consider during this period uh, of recovery uh, will be um, whether um, the lower level, uh, if, there, if, there, if there is to be a lower level of economic activity for a short period and before we fully recover, whether that leads to a further period of fiscal tightening. Um, there will, of course, be the question of whether other countries recover at the same speed as the UK, faster or slower. One um, potential concern in particular, possibly, uh, is the euro area. We haven't seen interest rates uh, in Italy, for example, uh, their government bond yields be as low and stable as in the US and the UK, that might be a risk. Uh, and of course, there is the question of supply chain disruptions. That might be one thing uh, to monitor and might be an impact on inflation further down the line. Uh, and of course, broadening away from uh, the virus considerations, that uh, leads on to um, the broader theme of uh, trade disputes. Uh, and um, uh, that's uh, something which, of course, was a theme before um, the virus came along. Uh, and in that context, of course, um, you know, economists looking forward, looking ahead to the end of June to see what developments, if any, there will be in terms of defining the UK's future trading relationship with the EU. Uh, that, of course, is another uh, big variable in terms of uh, uh, forecasts for uh, levels of, of activity uh, and potential frictions. Um, and um, then uh, there is, of course, the uh, ongoing uh, broader geopolitical risk too with the US election uh, this year. So. Uh, whilst at the moment all of the focus is on the virus, uh, there are a number of other factors there that we've mentioned. Um, but it does feel as though um, on the back of the um, Bank of England uh, numbers that uh, Colin referred to already, um, that we should be uh, expecting a difficult year this year. But at least what we can say on the optimistic front is that policymakers have moved rapidly uh, and decisively uh, to try and uh, create the best conditions they can. Uh, for a uh, you know a, a healthy uh, revival uh, when um, the health uh, judgments allow that to take place. So I think uh, that's my ten minutes, just about coming to an end, uh, and I will leave it there and hand over to the next speaker. Sam, thank you very much for that. Um, some very significant economic impacts there, very clearly, uh, and indeed sort of um, huge responses from central governments around the world. Uh, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Probably too long, I think. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so thank you, Sam. That, that's the macroeconomic backdrop. Um, I suppose the next question really for us is how has that backdrop translated itself into some of the more micro risks and, and market levels that uh, we deal with on a daily basis and indeed that, that corporate treasurers 
uh, have to face into on a daily basis and, and seek to risk manage. Um, so over the next sort of 20 or so minutes, we'll, we'll take a look at some of those market levels and indeed some of the near-term themes and talking points that, that we've been discussing with our client base over the past few months uh, in the initial phase of the crisis. We'll then also try and look forward and very clearly, none of us have a crystal ball. And I think one of the recurring messages that we hear from companies is that nobody knows what the future may be. It'll be truer now more so than it, than it ever is. But we'll try and look forward to maybe some of the opportunities uh, that these market levels might present and maybe look to some of the um, activities that might be done in a slightly different way going forward. Um, so we'll run through FX, commodities, interest rates, and we'll try and pull that together with a with a review of Treasury policies towards the end. Um, so with that, I will hand over to Rodri to talk about FX and commodities. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Colin. And, and thanks to the ACT for giving me the uh, the excuse to wear a shirt and trim the, uh, what I was claiming was rather fetching desert island beard that I've been cultivating over the last couple of months. Um, well, uh, well, a snapshot of that might have been a fairly decent summary of my personal experience of lockdown. I've, I've opted for something equally grisly, I'm afraid, in the form of these four charts uh, on the next slide to capture the challenges of the pandemic for a corporate participant in FX and commodity markets. Um, truth be told, the, the first chart of UK manufacturing PMI could sadly have been any economic activity gauge from the last couple of months as we've got that. But that familiar sight of it falling off a cliff since the lockdown measures started to bite. Um, obviously, this provided the, the primary challenge of, of uh, causing our, our customers to have you know, significant revenue and cash flow losses. Um, but many have also faced a, a second order impact where the exposures that they've been hedging through derivatives are, are simply not materialized. Now, while this isn't necessarily a problem if underlying markets haven't moved at all, as you can see from chart number two, which shows sterling US dollar or cable um, and its, uh, its implied volatility, markets have been on a little bit of a roller coaster, I shall say. As a result, the, the P&L impact has, has often been stark, um, and indeed the costs and cash flow impact of either closing out trades or, or rolling them over can be significant. And that's particularly true when you take into account illiqu illiquidity in markets and increased credit charges due to the higher volatility. <clears throat> now, as, as Sam outlined, central bankers have done their best to, to re-establish some sort of semblance of smooth functioning of markets and providing a backstop to the economy. Um, and as the third chart of euro dollar spots and forward point shows, this has had a knock on impact in terms of underlying pricing for hedging going forward. An exporter based in the euro zone in a normal world now is looking at a much best, better position from a cost of hedging perspective when you look at spot and forward point. And similarly, as you can see in chart four, an, an airline would have loved to have been buying jet down here in in more normal times, but it's not exactly help helpful if trade's been crushed and no planes are actually flying. Now, all of these factors have required an incredible response from you all and thankfully kept me from spending all my time watching Netflix and doing virtual pub quizzes. Um, but as with most issues that treasurers face, as you can see from the table on the next slide, um, th there are pros and cons to any chosen path and individual circumstances have often dictated how best to proceed. As, uh, as you scan through the table on the left, I hope many of the points um, will, will chime with your experiences over the last few months. You know, if you've been dealing with overhedged positions with negative mark to markets and considering whether to, to close out or to roll. Do you take the cash flow impact now or, or eat into valuable credit lines or, and pay a heightened transaction cost that might be involved when rolling? Similarly, with positions with positive mark to market, it, it may be worth restriking to market or if the exposures don't exist, closing them out to free up counterparty limit and helpfully at the same time release cash. But how much is that going to cost? These, these short-term dilemmas 
are going to have lasting Im impacts on how you deal with FX and commodity exposures in the future. And indeed, how you equip your staff with the expertise to deal with situations that are, that are far from ordinary. One clear common thread would be the impact from having hedges in place that impose obligations. You know, are there different strategies or different hedging instruments out there that would provide a different outcome to those that you face today? Will you, in this backdrop, leave more exposure unhedged to avoid these kind of scenarios? Or will you, you look to actual option-based products despite the higher upfront costs? And if so, who's going to pay for them? Is it going to be your bottom line or, or the end customer? One other common theme would be around the perils of execution once you, you've actually decided what to do. Uh, I think it's fair to say FX uh, markets and market participants are often uh, championing the, the deep liquidity of those markets, but anyone dealing over the last couple of months will have potentially experienced sharp gaps across spot forward and options markets. Risk transfer spreads have widened and auto pricing limits on platforms have come in. In this environment with, with non-standard transactions in terms of size and, and indeed profile to execute, we've had perhaps forgotten methods such as working at best orders or, or heaven forbid dealing via the phone again. They've made a bit of a comeback as, as customers look to get certainty of execution and to minimize their costs. I guess an open question I would pose for you all is, is whether you feel your colleagues, employees today, who are used to perhaps an era of pushing BAU type trades through a platform, have the, the experience to explore these other alternatives with their liquidity providers. Sometimes the short term cost efficient approach won't always be so in the long run. Now, while, while you ponder that, and before I hand over to my colleague Neil for the topic of rates risk management, I thought I'd leave you with a a quick case study on slide 10 to, uh, to bring these themes to life. Now, by far the most common and indeed pressing issue in my space over the last couple of months has been around dealing with over hedge positions that have significant mark to market. Um, clearly corporates haven't wanted to expose themselves to further P&L volatility post de-designation of these hedges. And where rolling to future dates has not been possible, they've often had to close them out with sometimes significant cash flow implications. In this particular example, however, we had one corporate in the, in the relatively fortunate position where some of their overhead position was in the money and able to actually act as an offset for the negative impact coming from other parts of their book. As the, uh, as the slide outlines, this, uh, this UK consumer goods company had a, a portfolio of in the money cable forwards where they were buying dollars at better than the market. And on the flip side, they had a portfolio of out of the money diesel swaps where they'd locked in their purchase price much higher. Now, as you would expect, they considered all the available avenues to them. Could they roll it forward to future dates? Potentially, but the forecasts were none too certain and they're still none too certain. And credit appetite needed to maintain for other requirements. They could have also looked to have traded um, the other way around and closed those trades out in isolation. But again, there are issues there in that they could have closed out one trade and by the time they got round to the other, the positive mark to market on that wasn't enough to compensate for the negative on the trade that had already been closed. Then instead, they ultimately settled on closing out the trades together, working with us to get efficient execution in highly illiquid markets and ultimately achieving the desired cash neutral outcome. This has left them in a much better space with the credit line there in place to act as and when those forecasts become a bit more concrete once again. Now, hopefully that relatively nifty bit of risk management was a uh, was a good example of what your peers are having to do in these challenging times. And for more on that subject, over to you, Neil. Actually, Neil, just before before you um, start, Neil, just a couple of questions for, for Rodri. Rodri. Um, oh. One is, do you think that the official sector feel like they've normalised the, the, the FX and commodities markets um, already? Yeah. 
Um, and, and I guess possibly connected, the other question is, is around liquidity. Um, and clearly the markets are a lot less li liquid at the moment, but is that, is that the new, new normal? I mean, there was some just debate even before the virus that actually FX markets were becoming less and less liquid. Mm -hmm. So even if this hadn't happened, would we be expecting to see less liquidity? I mean, there's certainly an argument that I've heard many times that the, the regulation that was put in place post-2008, which ultimately has been all about ultimately trying to make banks safer, um, has had the unintended consequence of potentially making markets more fraught. And I'm talking about the ability of, of banks to be there to, to actually provide um, liquidity um, which can be quite difficult when you've got stuff like Volcker Rule in place, which, which makes it difficult for them to have outstanding trading positions and what have you. So I've, I've certainly got some sympathy with those that, that do say, regardless of the, the current situation, we've been moving to a, a position where markets have been a bit more fraught. There's also the fact that they tend to be dictated a lot more by algorithmic execution and by, by that I don't mean sort of algorithmic order execution but the actual algos that are there trading in milliseconds around news headlines which when they see a headline they're programmed to buy certainly in, in droves and it can make liquidity just disappear. Um, so, so there are market dynamics that have made it a bit more fraught in certain markets but then on the flip side you do you see the BIS is a survey which comes out which shows you know the numbers in, in ever escalating trillions of, of daily volumes going through. So it, it, there's a bit of one half a dozen. You know, anecdotally, it does feel to me certainly against the um, backdrop we've had in 2000, since 2016, um, in the case of Sterling, for example we do seem to go through these bouts of extreme illiquidity in spot swaps, you know, in options where there just sometimes simply isn't a market there anymore. So while you can be absolutely fine the vast majority of the time, it may just be sort law, if you excuse my language, where it's your time to execute something sizable at the same time as the headline comes out and, and the market just, just isn't really there. Um, in terms of normalising, you know, the, the current markets, I'd say it's got better. You, you look at the first chart I showed um, around sort of volatility coming out. We've, we've moved away from the extremes that we saw perhaps in, in the middle of March. Um, but, and it, it's a big but for, for me, you know, dealing with UK customers who are very, very focused on sterling, it, it seems to be that we're never too far away from another potential headline that that, that could see um, you know significant gappy price action once again. That's really helpful. Thank you. I think, I think from, from my perspective, perspective that reinforces because I'm you know I've, I've been, been treasury forever, forever. Um, and, and back, back in the day we have rolling hedging programs. programs. It, it sounds very much as though certainly in the world of effects, having, having rolling FX, FX programs is, or hedging programs is probably a prudent approach at the moment just because of the level of uncertainty that people are seeing? And, look, I think ultimately with, you know, programmes, I think ultimately you've got to devise them so that they suit your business. I mm -hmm. think our sole contention would be, well, two sole contentions if that's possible. <laughs> One, uh, yeah. you know, you can have hedge funds who, uh, you know, they spend all their day trying to pick the, the right level in the markets and, and they will ultimately get it wrong. Um, and they're often cited as the smartest people in the room. Um, so having a sort of regular systematic program where you look to smooth the impact of markets over time seems a very defensible strategy to me. But the addition we would suggest to that is building flexibility to your policies in terms of the instruments you can use or have different ranges of cover that you can use so you can flex it according to the, um, the circumstances at that time. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. Sorry, I interrupted. Um, I think we were going to move to Neil next. Sorry. Absolutely. Over to you, Neil.
Thanks, Thanks Audrey. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so we can move to the next slide, please. Um, much like the, uh, the FX slides, I've, I've tried to encapsulate uh, impacts on the fixed income markets uh, of COVID-19. And I, I do feel a little bit like the boy who cried wolf um, about rates being at uh, or near historic lows. Uh, it seems to be like a, a yearly occurrence over the last five years. But to try to show just the move that we've seen in sterling on the first graph, we've shown the progression of the uh, sterling swaps curve um, uh, out to 20 years since the beginning of the year. And you can see uh, it's been quite a, quite a fall in rates. I think probably what's been more interesting from a rate perspective globally is just how uh, rates have converged. As central banks, as Sam pointed out, have, have acted early and acted quickly uh, with monetary policy. Uh, and I think that might be interesting for you know, the corporate community as they think about currency mixes uh, going forward. Um, on, uh, on the third graph, uh, also what's been interesting um, is uh, the decoupling, again, of LIBOR to overnight rates. Obviously, the banking, in this case, we look at LIBOR versus Sonia. The Bank of England has been quite active uh, to pump liquidity in and, and, and uh, proactive in cutting rates. However, LIBOR rates haven't fallen uh, uh, base rates or indeed overnight rates lower, rather the opposite and have increased. Um, I think this, again, highlights the risk to the LIBOR product, if you like, that there is a, a, an inbuilt credit risk uh, to that index. Um, and certainly, I guess, will be something that will be followed by, uh, by regulators as they think about the transition from LIBOR to Sony over the next uh, 18 months. And then finally, I think it would be, uh, uh, be wrong not to look at the impact of credit spreads. Uh, clearly, we saw a, a, quite a widening in credit spreads. Um, uh, once the uh, the full impact of the of the crisis was known, but given the the the, the actions by central banks globally, those credit spreads have have snapped back, and that's probably despite what's been quite a busy time in terms of issuance for uh, the corporate sector, as they sought to bolster liquidity. And I guess one observation on this is that you know, albeit even though credit spreads are considerably wider. That has been offset to some degree by uh, benchmark yields, um, whereas all in borrowing costs are you know, marginally wider, but not significantly so. If we look to the next uh, slide, please. Um, so what does this mean for the corporate treasurer from a rate perspective? Well, just thinking about what we've seen over the last uh, six to eight weeks um, since we've been in lockdown, I think very much similar to the FX world, we've seen, uh, you know, restructures uh, or com companies looking to restructure existing hedges where possible. Um, similarly, as, as releasing near-term liquidity or indeed managing down credit exposures that they have to, uh, to their own swap providers to free up limits for them to do uh, transactions elsewhere. Uh, there's also been an increased uh, focus on pushing back the timing of cash flows clearly in line with the business profile where potentially EBITDA levels have dropped uh, in response to uh, you know, uh, consumer activity. But also we've seen, as you'd imagine, uh, changing in tactical views. So can corporates do, um, you can, can they use the current market to respond to potentially add value for, for future years? And I think one of the obvious um, uh, and, and most common discussions we've been having with our corporate base is the idea of pre-hedging or indeed increasing the proportion of fixed. Now, this has obviously a couple of ways you can do this, but whether it's locking in future, uh, locking in rates ahead of future issuance, but also reducing exposure to LIBOR dislocation. With corporates asking themselves that have been lucky enough uh, to have floating at rate exposure, whether there, whether there remains further upside to retaining that floating rate exposure. Um, one of the things that we have been working with our, our corporate clients on uh, is to kind of devise you know, hedging strategies and indeed looking at the current market to, to determine whether uh, it is an appropriate thing for them to be looking at uh, pre-hedging. Uh, we, we use a scorecard approach where we use a number of different factors, such as uh, the absolute levels of benchmark yields or swap rates, uh, the cost of forward hedging, and indeed implied volatility levels. Um, scoring these on a, on a, on a uh, range of one to ten, we can determine whether or not it is uh, an appropriate thing to do for, for, our, for the corporate to enter into um, 
uh, pre hedging. So, Next is slide, so, so is that scorecard something that perhaps the corporate could um, do for themselves? Or is that something uh, I, I, that you do internally? Well, it's something that we've developed internally. I think it's more for, for Colin. It's, it's one of Colin's team that, that has developed this. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, sure. Happy to comment on that, Neil. Yeah, it's, it's one approach uh, to trying to put a sort of quantitative lens on re-hedging or fixing. There's many approaches and qualitative factors would need to be taken into account as well. But, I mean, this is one approach that we actually developed with the corporate uh going back probably six weeks ago, two months ago, just to try and put sense. We looked at the absolute level of yields, the steepness of the curve, so how much they were maybe paying before we'd starting hedge, that the timing of some of their missing um, bond maturities, and indeed looking at the implied ability uh, in the market, which is probably a little bit higher than it is now as, as volatilities come in again. Um, as with all these things, though, one approach, there's probably no no right answer, but this is really just trying to put some uh, thinking and analysis around that uh, sort of quantitative question uh, around pre-hedging. Well, it's really helpful to understand. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt. Thanks. No problem. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Um, what we've looked at here is just to consider, again, the, the curtain of global rates. Um, what are the things that your corporates will uh, look at in the, in the, in the you know, coming months is whether or not the uh, the current mix of debt is an appropriate one. Uh, historically, corporates have typically balance sheets um, in, in those currencies with lower interest rates uh, for for obvious reasons. Uh, an example of this is you know U.S. corporates um, borrowing in euros um, at possibly less economic levels than uh, issuing dollars and swapping uh, so that they can gain a benefit in the uh, interest rate line and, 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 and consequently uh, an EPS benefit. You know, but with, with lower rates globally, there may be opportunities to rebalance the debt mixes across currencies away from necessarily historically low rate currencies such as euro or indeed Swiss franc. Um, and this may be particularly timely in the context of higher leverage levels, uh, where ratios may have less headroom to absorb currency moves. Next slide, please. Um, and then one, one final slide for me, and, and maybe slightly counterintuitively, um, you know, should you add, should you consider adding floating rate? Um, probably one thing that's been overlooked uh, in terms of floating rate uh, borrowing. Uh, is its effectiveness of hedging against um, um, cash balances. Um, and because corporates have typically looked at cash balances as being, um, I guess, in some degree, cyclical, um, considering that floating rate as a balance sheet hedge uh, against those cash balances uh, may be something that has been overlooked. Um, obviously, though, with, with corporates holding higher levels of liquidity, uh, floating, rate balance, floating rate exposure will provide an economic hedge against that, and indeed, in some cases, may reduce cost to carry against those balance sheet hedges. Um, so I think, you know, this is something that, you know, we, we have been looking at for, for some corporates, not, not all, but we, again, we show a case study here where um, recently we had a corporate we had been working with um, was looking to target higher levels of cash balance or higher levels of, of flowing rate exposure, um, and took the decision despite the curve shape and the absolute levels of rate to swap a new fixed rate issue to floating. And indeed, uh, looking ahead to LIBOR trans, uh, transition, chose to hedge again using Sonia rather than LIBOR. So I think that was an interesting development. I think it's one that we will expect greater conversation around um, as you know, we turn our attention to uh, LIBOR transition uh, more generally in the second half of this year. Um, so now I'll hand it back over to Colin, um, who will consider how Treasury policies may adapt in the current environment. Uh, thanks very much again, Neil. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, then please, slide 15. Um, th th there's probably a world of things we could cover in this uh, topic. I think it's a broad topic, um, but I'll try to stick to, to two or three, I think, in the interest of time. Um, 
when we look at companies' reaction to the COVID crisis, uh, in terms of where we are at the minute, I suppose one of the things that we've noted is that a lot of companies have maybe dealt with their initial uh, near-term priorities. So if you like, the, the sort of firefighting stage of the crisis, if, if you want to call it that, they've maybe addressed their immediate liquidity needs. They've, they've looked to secure additional funding to get them through the next 12 or 18 months or, or longer term. Um, and they've started to deal with the, the huge changes to operating models and, and business models and so on. I think much of that has maybe been done. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's still a lot to do perhaps for some companies, but a lot of the companies we talk to are maybe now at the point where they're in a position to take stock of their the sort of longer term view, if you like, uh, in a more measured way. Um, and as part of that, one of the obvious things that, that a lot of companies we talk to are looking at is treasury policies and asking themselves whether or not those policies are suitable for the current environment, given the, the huge changes that have taken place. Um, so to call out maybe sort of two or three key points um, in relation to adapting Treasury policy, I suppose first and foremost, as, as Rodri alluded to earlier, um, I think what a huge number of companies are looking at at the minute and are dealing with is simply understanding what their risk exposures are. So forecasts are likely to have changed enormously. Uh, business might have dropped off a cliff for some companies. Other companies might actually be seeing a, an increase in potential cash flows. Um, r- regardless of the circumstances, most companies will have been affected in a, in a very material way. So they'll need to adapt their forecasting processes to capture uh, the range of potential outcomes that might occur over the next 6, 12 months, longer term and to update those forecasts on a much more regular basis than, than would have been the case previously. Um, on, the first point around, on, the, on the first point around um, adapting the forecasting processes, we think it's really important for companies to build scenarios into their forecasting um, models so to look at a range of possible outcomes, both in terms of the, the, the quantum of cash flows and, the, and indeed the timing, um, without building so many scenarios that the central message becomes confused. So I think one of the treasurers in the earlier session today uh, referred to this as, as scenario paralysis, where they're simply trying to model almost too much that, that the message becomes a little bit lost. Um, I think once that's been done, then these scenarios can be stress tested in order to understand the impact of market risk and cash flows and key metrics, if, if you like, to understand the set of events that, that breaks the business or puts the, put the, puts the metrics under undue strain. And indeed, this is going to be increasingly important where financial metrics have come under pressure and under stress, given potentially reduced operating cash flows, uh, potential increases in debt levels, etc. So companies will need to review their their risk appetite um, across key metrics in light of those uncertainties and potentially reduce headroom to some of those metrics. Um, Secondly, once the forecasts and scenarios have been built and the exposures of the company are understood, or at least the range of potential exposures are better understood, then I think at that point, companies can really start in earnest to look and to look at their treasury strategies again and to look at how they can address some of these risks. I, I won't dwell on this point. I think it was touched upon earlier when, with uh, Rodri and Sarah. Um, but, you know, this is perhaps an opportunity to fundamentally review what those hedging strategies are trying to achieve, uh, what the objectives are, and maybe challenging the status, the status quo um, so I think the earlier example was around uh, hedging FX transaction risks and maybe commonly uh, companies have used rolling or layered strategies across an 18-month or 24-month time horizon. So is that the right approach? I think, as we said earlier, it seems very defensible in the current environment. But probably one of the key questions is how can that approach be tailored to deal with a range of potential forecast outcomes uh, with respect to timing and, and, and volume? So that would probably bring me on to the third point, uh, one of flexibility and adaptability. Um, And in our opinion, at times like this, it's absolutely vital that companies look to try and build in flexibility uh, into those hedging policies and make sure they're they're adaptable and able to adapt within a a sort of adequate time frame. Um, We said earlier that this was something that we've been discussing and many companies have probably been discussing pre-crisis, but obviously the, the... ability to be flexible within your given strategy comes to the fore at times like this. So how do you, how how might you build in flexibility? Well, there's a number of ways in which you can do it. There's there's probably a wide number of ways. One might be hedging instruments. So for example, do you look at purchase options to deal with forecast uncertainty or to take out tail risks, but leave upside uh, benefits in place? 
this obviously might increase the cost of hedging due to the premium payable, but it obviously helps to deal with those downside risks or tail risks or deal with sort of uh, uncertain forecasts, if you like. Other ways might be allowing flexibility within uh, hedging ranges. So if you have a particular range of 50 to 75 percent cover over a time period, how might you make that more flexible? Do you, do you sort of allow flexibility within the range? Um, and indeed, in, in the execution approach to enacting some of these strategies. So thinking through what the best execution approach might be if market volatility uh, remains or returns. Do you, for example, leave orders uh, trying to target particular levels for FX transaction hedging? Um, so there's a number of ways that flexibility can be built in. And then last but not least, um, looking at the relationship with your banking group. And in particular, I think it's going to be important to stay close to your banking group um, over the coming months and to engage proactively with them. There's, again, a number of reasons for this. Um, obviously, as forecasts change, banks will need to and will want to understand the impact on the business, um, understand what they can do to help in terms of providing liquidity support, understanding the company's credit position, um, so what that might mean on availability of credit lines, et cetera. And indeed, as well as that, I mean, banks, I think, need to and want to be there to be able to provide market insight and color for companies and to help them through these periods of volatility. So, for example, by helping companies to understand better uh, investor demand, pricing, maturities, et cetera, in the bond markets or in the loan markets. So looking at availability of loan market financing. Is there a five year market? Is it only three years? For example, what's happening with pricing? Um, and also, indeed, some of the additional insight and services that banks can provide, so maybe helping with some of the points that I, I touched on earlier, looking at trying to sort of model the impact of, of market risks um, on, on some of the cash flow scenarios. So very briefly, just moving on to the next slide, um, we have put a, a very brief example of um, some of the work we've done in the past, helping a company to look at its treasury policy. Um, I'll go through this very briefly in the interest of time, but but this was a UK company looking at its FX transaction hedging policies. Uh, this was pre the crisis, so this was dated back to late last year. And the main questions were, uh, number one, is the existing sort of rolling slash layered approach correct? And number two, should the company think about extending the, the maturity of its hedging program? Uh, so tactically, it quite liked the, the market levels um, and maybe wanted to lock those in for a longer tenor. And if they did that, what were the key questions? How could they build flexibility into that approach? Because they ran the risk of that approach, putting them slightly out of sync with their peer group. Um, so in this instance, we were able to help the company model uh, its cash flows and in particular, look at trying to attribute risk to particular currencies. So the flows in question were a number of G10 and emerging market currencies. Uh, the little chart in the bottom right tries to attribute uh, risk to each of those currency flows. Um, it then looks at diversification to get a net risk figure. And then the chart in the bottom right looks at different potential uh, hedging strategies. So this one in particular is really just for sterling euro. Um, looking at the impact of the current approach, so um, the, the sort of smoothing that results from this sort of rolling or layered approach uh, versus a smoother layered process over a longer term. So the light green line on that chart is obviously much smoother. Um, now, now, that analysis can obviously be extended. And one of the things we talked about with this company was indeed looking at including options if they were hedging uh, for additional tenors so that they wouldn't be caught offside relative to their peer group. Um, so this probably emphasizes the, the last point that I made in the previous slide, that um, it may be important to sort of stay close to your banking group over the coming period and indeed look at ways in which they can assist you because most corporate treasury departments uh, at the best of times are, are, are pretty light. So there may be a lot of heavy lifting to do over the coming months. And this is one example of ways in which banks can, can maybe uh, assist corporates to get through some of that work. Um, and, and Colin, I that think... really concludes, I think. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Sarah, I think I cut across you. No, that's OK. It's exactly what I was going to say. I think that's a really good spot to leave. Um, I think that thank you very much indeed, all of you, for the, your insights over the last 50 minutes, actually. Um, it's been very, very interesting. I hope everybody's found it helpful and informative. I certainly have. And hopefully that 
um, we've been able to give you a number of things to consider as you review risk management strategies, how they may need to change, both as a result of recent events, but sort of the longer term events that have been alluded to. Um, I think the key message of, of keeping close to your bank is is one that we would all do well to uh, to bear in mind. Um, the I would like to thank Lloyds very much indeed for your time this afternoon. Um, there are other live stream sessions that will be going ahead today, so please do join us back later in the day. And there are a number of pre-recorded sessions as well that are available to watch now. Um, finally, I'd like to thank Colin, Sam, Rodri and Neil and to Lloyds Bank for sponsors. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Thank you.